just SAN, it's the daily life of Voice Adrift. Uh, we were not able to debug for a very long time, so it was a complicated uh, project. It was difficult. Um, so there were quite a lot of challenges and difficulties. I've been asked to do this talk because while I was in Words Adrift, people think I can remain productive. And then I seem to be able to do different tasks in, uh, at the same time. So I spent some time thinking what I did is different to others. And then turns out I feel like I'm just not following the rule very well. So today I'm going to talk about how and why I break the rules. Uh, so there's four sections I'm going to be talking. The first section is introduction. Uh, it's going to be 80% of this talk. Definitely not true. Uh, and then the second part is client service structure. The third one is a team structure of Words Adrift. And then the fourth one is my daily tasks and the rules I broke. Uh, so I want to introduce me a bit. So I worked in game industry for nine years. I started as a game designer uh, and I worked on a MMORPG. Uh, I really hated being a designer, so I started thinking I should be a coder. So I went to Newcastle University and started a game engineering course. After graduation, I joined No Split Interactive, uh, where it's an indie company in Newcastle, where there we made games in different platforms like PS4, PS Vita, Xbox One, Switch, mobile, PC, as well as lots of projects um, for the VR, like uh, Gear VR, HoloLens, um, other, yeah, HTC Vive. Um, and then lastly, I joined Bosa Studio and started my role breaker life. This is the MMORPG I mentioned when I did in China. This is the Hungry Horde, uh, which is a PS Vita game. Uh, it's converting humans into zombies and then passing levels, collecting stickers, and then playing minigames. And that's Vostok Inc., which is the multi platform game I mentioned. Um, it's a twin stick shooter game. Uh, with a bit of like cookie clicker. And you're exploring the solar system, defeating the aliens, and then conquering the planet and making money in the planet. And I'm currently, this is both the projects, I'm currently working on an unannounced project. I can't say anything about it. Uh, so let's watch the trailer of Words Adrift. Don't play my playlist. <laughs> um, how, okay. Uh, not finished about Words of Drift. So Words of Drift um, is a big project. We have 301 islands in the world. All the players are in the same world, same server. Everything is synced and all the physics is synced as well. So it's complex. <coughs> And then we have some really complicated system. For example, we have shipbuilding. You can design your ship from scratch. And then you can build every single ship part yourself. For example, engine, sail, cannon. Or like furniture, like table, desk, or like stove where you can cook food. Or like loom, you can craft cloths and even make customized clothing. Um, like every single ship part is also different. It's based on what materials you use, based on what blueprint you use. Uh, so for example, aluminum is the lightest. Eternium is good to increase the overheat limit because engine does go overheat. Um, and gold adds the lift of the ship so you can make heavier um, items on your ship. So whether a ship is resilient, whether it's fast, 
whether it takes more damage. It's based on how you design it. Uh, shipbuilding is kind of like a system that's easy to know and people notice about it, they care about it. But there's also some other system. People doesn't really care, but we also spend a lot of time on it. For example, creature system. So our creature system is like, creatures can actually get hungry. When they get hungry, they'll find food, they'll go to the tree. They'll get tired, they'll rest. They'll mate, they'll lay eggs. And they're even aging, and eventually they'll die. Why join BOSA? If you're working in this, <laughs> if you know you're going to be working, nobody's skipping the ads. <laughs> you like ads? I can finish it. So if you know you're working in a game where all players in one world, where no thing's switching, everything's synced, persistent world, physics-based, you're going to want to work on it. Because as a coder, what we want is challenge. Uh, although if you join BOSA right now, just so if it's not obvious enough, we are hiring. Uh, <laughs> although you, if you're drawing both right now, you won't be working on Words Adrift. But as I mentioned, I was on the unannounced project, which is also full of challenges. It's interesting. So if you want to join BOSA, click that link. You can't click it, but just remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let's start the second part. Client server structure. Uh, the client, uh, we use Unity to build it. And then server, there's actually two parts. So the left part, that, uh, we, is game logic related, like gameplay related server. It's built by Spatial OS. And then that part of server is like, uh, it's basically database related server and it's some like a backend logic that's built by all the server. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's built by Java code. Uh, and then for the spatial OS server, it's actually different types. So for example, we have FSIM. FSIM is where we simulate all the physics. As I mentioned before, all the physics are simulated on the server. A client just gets update of the position and rotation. The only exception is player, because we don't want player to feel laggy. We don't want them to say, you walk there, and then server says, you should be there. They move back. So we don't want player to feel that. So player is the only exception. So player sends update to the physics server saying, I'm here, update everything else. GSIM is our brain, which is all the game logic goes. For example, uh, a player shoot another player. That sends the events to the GSIM. Then GSIM say, did that hit? Is it allowed to hit? Is it PVE or PVP? How much damage it, it does? And then it sends an update of health to both of the clients saying, this is the result. Um, OK. Let's talk about the team structure. That's our, our lovely players. Uh, we have five teams, marketing, QA, development. That's actually two teams. Uh, I'll explain it later. And then DevOps, and CS team, and community. So. Uh, Development team, why there's two teams? Because I mentioned before, we have two types of server. One is gameplay server, one is the actual REST service. Uh, and then the gameplay team is actually, they are doing all the Unity related client work. They're also doing all the spatial OS related uh, game logic thing. Because when you fix a bug, you might need to change the server code as well as the client code. Uh, and the server team is purely doing all the database related REST server stuff. Uh, I probably haven't mentioned, so Words Adrift is a community crafted MMO, which means we talk to player a lot. There's three main ways player can talk to our CS team and community team, uh, which is Discord. We have 4,000 players there. Uh, there's Forum, which uh, not only our CS team but also QA are very active there. Uh, there's CCC team, which is short for uh, Community Cloud Council, uh, all the members from it are actually selected from player. So they have the right to talk directly to us. They can give suggestions, they can even make decisions. So there was one update we had, it's called the Wheel of the Council, which the whole update was based on their suggestions. Uh, there's also one way that player can talk directly to our devs, which is Trello board. Some of the player, they made a Trello board 
which they are actually creating tickets saying, I want you to do this. I want this feature. I want that. Lots of tasks. And devs just look at them saying, OK, this is feasible. Oh, this makes sense. Then we actually choose tasks to do and then mark it as in progress or mark it done or mark it we're not going to do it. So players know exactly how we're thinking about things, how we're actually doing things. OK, now we're going to talk about my daily tasks and the rules I broke. Uh, I want to talk about the rules I broke first. So, so when I talk about my daily tasks, you will have a better understanding of why I broke them. These are the general rules. It works in most of the situation, which the first is rebuild when code changes, so you get a synced version of everything. Uh, keep a close eye on deployment. That normally applies for DevOps, because when you deploy something, you want to watch it, watch all the logs to see whether there's some problem. They can catch it as early as possible. And third one is shut down distractions, so you, you don't lose your thought of what you were doing. And the fourth is task log to record what you've done. Uh, it was a requirement in Worlds that everybody needs to fill in the task log, saying what you've done today, so the managers and everybody else would know, OK, this is what people are doing, and whether there's something we haven't targeted. Um, the fifth is worst thing first, a real common one. Uh, if you tackle down the difficult thing in the morning, then all the rest is the easy peasy and you can get everything done. Um, the sixth is focus on the task at hand. So you concentrate on stuff. It makes your mind sharp. But unfortunately, I have to break all of them. So these are my daily fixed tasks, which means if there's no emergencies, everything's fine. There's no fire. This is what I'm going to do every day. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm actually, oh, I didn't mention, I forgot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a full stack developer. I'm actually in three teams uh, because we didn't have a DevOps for a long time. So uh, we are covering the DevOps job. So I'm actually in gameplay team, server team, DevOps team. For gameplay and server team, it's easy. It's just normal coding, bug fixing, features, right? But there's one problem in the gameplay team. Uh, we are an online game, which, you know, we fix bugs in both client and server. That means we have to build server locally, run it locally, every time we change something. And do you guys want to guess how much time we use to build our client and server? Can you give me a number? No? Okay. It used to take a day. And uh, thanks for our colleague, Alan and Tristan. They made the whole system much better. They made an automated system. They make everything op optimized. Now it takes three hours. But still, it's not ideal. You're not going to wait three hours. Every time you change a line, you just want to test it, right? So I have to break this rule of rebuild when code changes. My way is I'm trying to avoid rebuild as much as possible. And there's three ways I'm trying to avoid it. So if you have a project that have different branches, I think most of your project does. So you have, uh, for example, we have a develop branch, which has latest of everything. We also have a release branch, which uh, is the latest of everything that we want to deliver to the player for the next update. Um, for the coders, you might have tasks mixed in something you want to fix in the develop, something you want to fix for the next update. And then jumping around between different branches definitely will require a reboot because they might have a big difference between them. So what I do is I have different repositories. Every single repository target one git branch. So when you update that branch, it's normally minor changes. And normally, I just wouldn't rebuild it. I just get away from it. Um, and the second is, uh, I think lots of companies do code reviews. So when I do my code reviews, I would try to get a basic idea of what has been changed. If it's client change, for example, UI has changed, I don't care. I wouldn't reboot. But if it's server changes, maybe. But if it's communication between server and client, 
that's the case you definitely have to reboot because otherwise they, they don't talk to each other. So the third one is if you don't care about the part that's changed. For example, somebody changed the inventory bark. I'm not working on inventory. I don't care. So I don't reboot. Um, yeah, I need to go back. And then we talked about gameplay, serv uh, gameplay team and server team. Uh, now we want to talk about DevOps team. There's normally three types of uh, tasks. The first one is maintenance, which we do a few times a week. The second is release a new update. The third is data migrating. I'll explain this one a bit. So basically we have player test server, which we want to simulate everything that we do on the production. So we we push our latest build to a player test server, let, let group of player test it. And once that's approved, we bring that to the whole, the, the prod environment. Uh, when we're doing that, we want to simulate exactly the same environment. So what we do is we migrate all the data, we copy the data to the PTS server. Uh, so for the maintenance, there's one thing which is automated task. This one is not a, ta uh, it's not a rule I broke, it's more like a suggestion. Uh, because maintenance is done a few times a week and then every time it's like two to three hours. So we made it fully automated. And because um, maintenance is like the, the type of task where it doesn't change the script between each time when you perform it. It doesn't change the steps. So every time, if you build a script of running things step by step, it doesn't change. So this type of tasks is best to be made automated. There's also three tasks that we made automated in our project. For example, everyday build. So that one is every morning we will make a build automatically for QA with all the latest stuff so they can test it. Um, not every morning, it's actually the night before. Um, and then the second is when something merged into the main branch on the backend service, it would automatically compile the code, run the unit test, and then if all that passed, it would deploy the backend service and actually start the server. And then the third one is nightly PTS, which is our player test server. Um, we decided to, every night, made it automated, so it got latest of everything in that branch. And then it just push that to the player. So player get latest of everything every day. Um, and then we're going to talk about the release update. I did break a rule there, which is keep a close eye on deployment. As I mentioned before, now I made it automated. So what I do is I type in something, like a hacker, and then done. And it just automatically do stuff like da, 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 and then just wait there. If I am a traditional DevOps, what I do is I'm just sitting there for two or three hours watching the screen. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to do that. So what I do is I actually very rely on an alert system. Uh, there's two type of alert mechanism in our project. The first one is Slack integration. So you can write some code uh, to trigger a Slack message in your code. So you say, I've done this step. Tell the Slack saying, I've done this. And when you do the next step, I've done this. So just by looking at the Slack message, you know what's going on, you know what step it is. Uh, I also would trigger report errors. So when something goes wrong, if blah, 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 do raise the alert to the Slack. So when I see the message, I know something goes wrong. I need to do something. But what if I missed the Slack? I just didn't see it. I was doing something else. And now we need Ops Genie. Does people know Ops Genie, what, what it does? No? Great! I'm glad I'm saying something you don't know. Uh, Ops Genie is a monitoring service. And then what it does is you still trigger it in the code, but when it's triggered, it would push notification for your phone. It sends email. It also sends text message. If you don't pick it up, it makes phone calls. So <laughs> no matter whether it's midnight to your clock, no matter whether it's weekend, 
no matter how drunk you are. You got to answer it. Otherwise, they keep calling you. So this is great when you want to make sure something you definitely need to know that something goes wrong. OK, uh, we talked about my fixed tasks. Let's talk about, oh, I forgot to show the, uh, this is, <laughs> sorry, um, this is the build system that we made, because we, we mentioned we have some good build system. This is one of it, which you can use this to uh, run all the steps automatically, or you can run each single steps. I use this quite a lot to basically help me reduce the rebuild thing I need to do. Uh, there's a, another one, which is Jenkins. If you guys are not using Jenkins, I suggest Google it and start using it. I didn't take any money from it. If they want to give me money, I'll take it. But this is really good. Like This is like you write your steps of things you want to do. And then once it's done, you just add some parameter. For example, here is git branch. I say which branch I want to build. And then I tell it uh, a different config. And then it would actually build everything. It would deploy to the Steam. It would also start the server for me. So it's just good. This is the automated task. Um, and then I want to talk about another big portion of my daily task. Emergencies and requests. I have no control over them. They keep coming. So what are they? The distract, uh, sorry, the, the emergencies. For example, REST server fails. Player can't authenticate uh, their client. It's normally Steam API not being stable, but sometimes it's our REST server has some problem. And then player can't log in. There's 20 different reasons. Normally that requires a dev to go deeper into the log and see what's going on and give some suggestions. Uh, there's player lost their ships. There's player lost their revivers. There's player can't access alliance. And what are these? They are distractions. Because we were saying we want to shut down the distractions and be focused. It's just impossible. Because CS team needs some support, and we're dead. We need to support them. Sometimes it takes five minutes to say, OK, this is a solution. You just do that. Sometimes it takes longer time. Like it needs a deeper look, and maybe it becomes a task later. So either way, you've been interrupted by the task you were doing. So after one year like this, I actually built up my way to smoothly go between tasks. And I was able to handle emergencies immediately. My tips are, so before you start the task, I normally would think about the whole task. I would investigate what the, the problem is. I would actually have a full idea of what I want to do. And I write down. I draw a flow chart, or I just write down step, step by step. And then when I have to be pulled away from my current task, I just go to that little chat, mark something saying, OK, I'm here, and write some keywords saying, OK, that's the next thing I need to be solved. Um, so when I, have, when, I, when I go back to the task, I can kind of easily get back into it. And then the third one is, Minimize your current working tasks list. Why there's a list? Because just imagine you were having task A. You've been interrupted. You have to start task B. You've been interrupted again. You have to start C. And then eventually you have a whole list of in progress waiting list. So what do we do? Do we always go back to the last one? No, what I do is I see which one I can finish first. So I'm trying to make my list smaller so I feel less like stressed. Um, and then we're going to talk about the requests. There's normally two types of requests, player suggestions and bug reports. We talked about we have a task log to write down what you've done today. Instead, I actually use it as a task queuing system because when you have new tasks, I use it to say, okay, how important is this task? How much time is actually going to cost me to do it? And then I insert it into my list 
So my test log actually becomes today, da -da 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 -da, tomorrow, da -da 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 -da. and then I think that's a good way to actually remind you what you're going to do, and it's a good thing for you to plan your things out. I probably shouldn't always walk. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we mentioned um, all the like request emergencies and fixed tasks. How do we do them all together at the same time? There's two keywords here. One is plan. It should probably be planning. And the second is parallelizing. So what I do is every morning when I go to the company, I see this is a task from my task log. I see this is a task I need to do. And then I pick my task. I see how I can parallelizing them, how I can finish them in a day. And then I actually do them. So when I pick the tasks, there's two rules I broke. First one is worst thing first. I think this works most of the time. When you have tasks that can be done in a day, but that's not worth a drift. We had one developer fixing one bug for two weeks. We have one developer, you all know the name, Dave, who did one issue, trying to fix one issue for two months. So this is not ideal for him, because every morning, <laughs> When we're having stand-up, he's saying, I'm doing the same thing, same thing, same thing. What I want is I want to deliver something. I want to be confident about myself. This is also the key secret of why people think I'm productive. Because I have a clear rule of how to select my task. Can most difficult task be done today? If you can, yes, do it. If you couldn't, do the easiest task today so you can finish something. And then the rest of the time, you do the difficult task. Um, yeah. And then uh, there's another rule I broke, which is focus on the task at hand, monotasking. I think it generally wouldn't work for IT companies because we're working with computers. They can do a lot of jobs. And since we're making a lot of job automated, you just do something and then you let it do its job and then you just wait. And let's see some of the waiting time. Uh, waiting for server to start up, two minutes. Build Docker image, five minutes. Corrupted Unity project to start, 30 minutes. And maintenance, two hours. Build spatial server and clients, three hours. And then di data migration, one day. So somebody say that oh, I have a phone call. somebody say that it's fine if there's two minutes I just go watch some video. That's very common what people do. But is that helping you focus? Is that helping you concentrate? You might in the end focus on the video. Oh, this is a pretty good one. I want to play this game. So instead of that, what I do is I want to actually paralyzing the tasks. So what I do is I normally would pick at least three tasks for each day to start my day and mixed with important bug, uh, important tasks, a task with long waiting time and a task that can fill your gap. Let's take an example. Uh, I start my day with maintenance, which we mentioned before. We do 10 minutes preparation and then the rest is just waiting. And then I do data migration. It's also 10 minutes preparation and then let it do its job. And then once these two waiting tasks has been doing this thing, I concentrate on my important task. And why here I have to fill the gap? Unity crashed. My debugger crashed. And then I have to wait uh, the server to start up. I would have to wait the, uh, the Unity to start up. Then I just fill the gap with code reviews because that's something you can get in and get out really quickly. Uh, and once everything start up, I go back to the important task and then maybe data migration say, okay, I've done my first step. Do you want to do something with my second step? So I do that and then do the important task and fill all the gaps with code review. Um, I have a clear order of how I pick the important task. That's my like personal uh, 
favor. So the first one is bug that's blocking QA from testing. That's super important. Uh, the second one is critical bug that players would be angry about because we care about player. The third one is features or bug that's in my area. The fourth one is feature or bug that's not in my area, not in anybody's area. I want to take that. I want to learn new stuff. So that's normally how I do. And these are the tasks that's best for fragment time. Code review, testing the bug or features you just finished, uh, investigate issue for system, and then snacking, walking around, chatting with his friends. Uh, okay, we talked about parallelizing tasks, but how about each task? Because we want to think the same thing. Each task has different steps. What if we can parallelizing the steps? So I did that. And here is an example. Uh, of a maintenance, there's mainly four steps. Lock down the server, kick out everybody. Validate a snapshot, uh, which is 600 me megabytes. I don't know whether you know a snapshot. It's basically <laughs> the saved data in our system. Um, the reason we need to validate it is because it's 600 megabytes. It's huge. And then Spatial OS uh, had, once has some problem, they're not able to fully save it. Sometimes it fully saves it. Sometimes it partially saves it. So you have to have your own program to validate whether this is a fully saved one. So that's what we did. And once it is a fully saved snapshot, we process it by cleaning up something that we don't want, correct something if it goes off. And then we start a new deployment with a process snapshot. So the validating and the processing, they both take an hour. So that's two hours there. What I did is because they do because automated tasks, it has to be validated before we actually process it. But we are human. So what I do is I actually have, I grab a snapshot, I validate it. At the same time, I process it. So when it's finished, no matter if it succeeds or not succeed, which we start over, I saved half the time. So that's basically, uh, I think, in most of the project, there's probably something we can think about how, whether we can, uh, Paralyzing steps, paralyzing tasks. Oh. And then we break so many rules, we have to maintain the quality. And the three key thing is test, test, test. The first test is you want to build and test everything you changed. For example, you just copy paste something from there to here, but you might miss the import. Or sometimes you're changing a variable name, but then you forgot one place. That's all going to result some problems. So no matter how small the thing you changed, always build and test. The second one is test everything that's possibly related. For example, I changed inventory system, but it might affect my crafting system because they're slightly related. <laughs> uh, the third one is if it's a bug, follow the exact repro step. Um, and test it again. I've been actually made lots of mistakes uh, because of this one. Because I know there's some bugs in the system. And then when I see a QA raise the ticket, and they say, OK, this has some problem. I'm like, oh, it must be this. I just fixed this. And then I'll mark this as done. And then QA come back saying, sorry, it's not fixed. I'm like, how? And then I look again and realize it's a, a similar bug in a similar system. It's just not the same bug. So, after, so I have to keep telling myself every time I fix bugs, I have to go step by step to make sure I have actually fixed the right bug. OK, this is a takeaway. Let me check the time. Oh, OK. Uh, I got 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to read through all this. You can take a picture. This is the final page. Uh, so instead of rebuild when code changes, I suggest we try to avoid rebuild. Oh, if it's a long rebuilding time, of course. Keep a close eye on deployment. I suggest let's set up a good alert system instead of watching it. So instead of shutting down distractions, I suggest we write down your thoughts and progress so you can switch between tasks. 
instead of task log to record what you've done, use it as a task queuing system and planner and reminder. Instead of worst thing first, I suggest accomplish something every day, even if it's just a small task. Instead of focus on the task at hand, I suggest plan your task first, then try parallelizing tasks and steps. Okie dokie, questions. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Question? Yes? Yes. Um, so I came from a sort of DevOps -y slash sort of system admin background, so you're 100% speaking my language for all of that. Um, and I mean, this isn't necessarily a question, but I, guess, I think you'd agree, like maybe there's a lot that people could learn from sort of looking at DevOps processes and things you can do. A lot of it is just trying to make your work efficient, like time efficient and effort efficient. Uh, it makes me think of like when you talk about automating. It makes me, there's a brilliant like XKCD comic where it's all things like um, attempting to automate things that repeated tasks. And say you're doing a task every day that takes like five hours of your time. Finding a way to automate that can save you so much. Whereas if you're maybe doing a little bit here and there, you don't necessarily need to waste your time automating it when it's going to take more effort to fix, to fix that problem than it takes to just do it. So, but there's a lot, so I think there's a lot of like, things to learn, like processes that people like in DevOps, and um, that is like part and parcel of like, big IT companies, not necessarily like the creative industry. There's a lot to, to be learned from that. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have a question? No, that was a good <laughs> <one>. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a favorite bug fix that you ever had that was an interesting story or something that was unexpected? Uh, I don't have favorite bug, <laughs> but I do have the most hated bug. So I think people who worked on Words of Drift all knows a bug called Helm bug, which lots of people working on it and then uh, I don't even think we fixed it now, like it spent I spent like two weeks on it. It's basically when you are driving the ship on the helm, and then for some reason, sometimes you get kicked off the, the helm, and then it has so different behaviors. Sometimes uh, you can't access to it again. Sometimes you get an error message, but you can get back. So it's actually a bug because, like I said, it's complicated. So it's actually three or four or five bugs. Like I myself, I fixed three logic problems. And then Marilo fixed few problems. Alan fixed prob few problems. And then eventually, <coughs> it's still not working perfectly. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers yeah. prop. <laughs> oh, do you know the helm bug? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Uh, hey, thanks for the talk, it was good. Okay. Um, you said the, your build and deployment takes about three hours, if not longer. Uh, what's the kind of QA process from that? So if you fix a bug and that goes into your branch that you're working on, do QA jump in on it straight away on that? Or yeah. do QA have to wait the next day for I the deployment and everything? I can explain that. Yep. So what we do is, um, as we mentioned, we have different branches. And then every time when we fix a bug, I would have a branch called caxing slash bug fixing slash the bug number. And then once my stuff get approved, that would get merged into develop or the release branch I mentioned. Um, and then that branch is built every night. So QA actually will need to test it the other day. Yeah, so that's... Um, yeah, is there like a, obviously you mentioned parallelizing your tasks, um, and that isn't necessarily aware throughout every department, so is there a way in which other departments can structure how they feed back to you to better enable you to work by that methodology, or is there some kind of, is there some kind of friction in place that you would like to be able to overcome to help you work that way? Mm, I think 
think our current QA team and then designer team are working quite good. Like we don't really say we have to wait until somebody do something, then we can do other stuff. The team between each other is like we have a list of tasks. You tackle that done. And then QA testing that in that time. You tackle another done. So it's like it's not parallelizing, but it's like it doesn't block each other. That's why I said the most important thing I do every day is I'm making sure that I'm not blocking QA. If there's any bug that's blocking QA from testing, that's critical. That's the most important thing. We have to address it as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, um, so World of Drift is using spatial OS. Yeah? Yes. Um, so you, the, you had that on the diagram. Um, can you give an example of some of the like kinds of tasks that the the Bossa REST servers are responsible for? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go back. This. Yeah. So Magic box um, in the middle. Bossa REST server. What we do is, for example, when you log in the game. We have Steam ID, we have Steam Secret. Mm -hmm. We have to authenticate the client. Uh, and then we just, uh, in the REST server, we actually use that secret and that ID, asking Steam API saying whether this client is authentic, uh, whether it's valid. That's why I say sometimes we have that error, sometimes it's Steam's problem, not us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things which we call it auth. Um, there's also, because for Words Adrift, we actually link the account <coughs> from Steam to both the email address and password. Mm -hmm. So that's two accounts. So all the linking between them happens in the REST server. Uh, also, all of uh, like your inventory or um, the schematic, like the blueprints you learn, all that stuff stored on the REST server as well. <coughs> yeah. Cool. So all the kind of database related stuff is on yeah. the REST server. Thank you. No problem. Oh, all the alliance and crew, that's all on the REST server. Hi. Hi. You were talking earlier about how um, you, uh, you can potentially get several tasks stacking up in a day, and then you have to say, so I'll do these ones today, and then these ones tomorrow, and so on and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. Um, I assume with that, there comes a sort of um, idea that I'm going to be able to do all these today, and then all these ones definitely be done tomorrow. Um, do you ever have it so that, I don't know, you have these ones to do on Monday, it gets to Tuesday, these ones are still not done, okay, um, is that... To that you, is, that, is that something where it's like, no, that's a real problem. I estimated no, that these no, would get no. done, or Plan is it just? and reality is not the same. That applies to everywhere. Like, for me, it's the same. I plan things in that way. I think I need to do that. And then that's my task for today. But as I mentioned, there's emergencies, there's requests. And then you have to insert tasks in your thing. So your task is actually changing every day. So don't feel like uh, upset that you haven't done the thing you were meant to be. Because you're doing other stuff, right? So that's totally fine. So it's more just like a, this is my most ideal plan of that's attack over the next plan. few days. It's not reality. <laughs> yes. Have you ever uh, given up with a bug and just decided that it's a feature now, not a bug? <laughs> <laughs> that's not on me. Uh -huh. Like, okay. <laughs> normally design makes a call. If design, design say, ah, fine, let's just, hmm. I'm like, thank you. I really can't fix it. Okay, I think the time is uh, up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.